Hello everyone, this is Gabriel Barjona and I'm here today with Lindsay Collins and we will be talking about learning curves and work sampling for our assignment 9 for ENGI 450. So first of all, a brief overview of learning curves. Learning curves are mathematical models of productivity where labor production is compared to production time based on the overall concept that performance improves with experience. And this learning effect was first noticed in 1920s uh, when they were building aircrafts and they started noticing that the more they built these aircrafts, the lower the production time. So they started modeling this learning curve and they figured out a graphical representation of a learning curve and what it means in the manufacturing environment. So the main uses of a learning curve. The learning curve can be best used for production planning along with estimating labor costs and the required production hours necessary to reach the production goals. It is not very applicable when there is no opportunity for increased efficiency. Uh, hence, it's more applicable in direct touch labor, such as a manufacturing line that is not fully automated. Given that automation is more specific on a on times on production times where the machine will always produce the same amount at the same rate. So how do we calculate learning curves? Cal learning curves follow the functional formula y equals ax to the power of negative b, where x is the cumulative production, y is the hours required to produce the x unit, a is the hours required to produce the first unit, and b is the learning rate parameter. These learning rate parameter is very important and you calculate it using the log of the percentage of the learning curve. That means if you're using a 90% learning curve, 80% learning curve, log of 0.8 or 0.9 divided by the log of 2. And there are uh, tables already that give you the specific learning parameter for each percentage of a learning curve. So for example, a 90% learning parameter, learning 90% learning curve will give you a 0.152 learning rate parameter. So now we're going to give a learning curve example. Assume that a production of the first unit required 200 hours and that there is a 70% learning curve associated with the process. How many hours are required to produce the 250th unit? So for A we have 200 hours which is the time it took for the first unit. For X we have 250 because we want to find out how many hours? 64 hours to produce the 250 units. So the main types of learning models, first of all, we have the U model, which is a basic model of production on the X unit. And then we have a slightly different model called the CA model. This is a cumulative average version of the U model. And it's the same concept as the U model. However, the production times are accumulated and then used to get an overall average of times and learning within the manufacturing environment. The first the first one is the most common personnel and supervisory learning. Let's say we just hired new personnel. We start applying a 70% learning curve until they reach the full capacity of production that is expected from them. The second one is the con continuity of production. That means one of our workers went on a vacation or this process uh, was stopped for a while and then once they get back to the process or get back to work, you have to apply some sort of learning curve in order so that they can easily get to their optimal production. The another one, another one is a meth when you change a method. That means the manufacturing environment changed their method to a new method and we need to apply a learning curve so that the workers can adapt slowly to this new method being implemented. And one of the last ones is if there is an special test and the workers using this machine being part of this process need to have some sort of learning curve in order to adapt to this same process. A little bit about work sampling. So what uh, work sampling is, is a technique that determines the proportions of total time that various activities contribute to the entire job by taking a large number of observations. So basically a work study is kind of the alternative to a time study, which we're going to talk a little bit more how they're different and why you would use work sampling in place of a time study in a little bit. But the three main things that um, a work study is used to determine are pro production standards, 
They're also used to determine machine and personnel utilization. And then finally, they're used to determine job allowances. So like I was saying, why would we use a work sampling technique rather than a time study? So the first um, place that we would use this is jobs that have high cycle time and low repetition. So if it was a job that was being done 80 times a day, for instance, you wouldn't want to use work sampling. A time study would be much better in that instance. But work sampling would be better if the task was only be, being done a few times a day if it wasn't repeated a lot. Also, collecting data is not as time consuming. Uh, with a time study, you have to be sitting there recording every time that the operator does something. But this just collects observations, so it's not as time consuming. Um, employees don't have to experience long observations like in a time study. You don't have to be watching the operators every move. Also, they're sometimes cheaper than time studies because you don't have to use as much resources. It doesn't take as long, which saves time and money. And then finally, data is gathered over a long period of time. Time studies are usually um, done over the course of a few days, but work sampling can be done over long periods and it can um, account for more factors. So um, there are six main steps to preparing for and performing a time study. The first is to start with a preliminary estimate. And this can be done by looking at either historical data or even if need be making an educated guess about an estimate. And then you have to go ahead and determine the desired accuracy of the results. And this kind of ties in with number three, which is determine the confidence level. For both of these, you need to determine what level of confidence you want on your work sampling. It's going to be 90%, 95%, and this will determine how much uh, work sampling needs to be done and how accurate the results need to be. And then you need to estimate the number of observations that you think are going to take place for each task. Developing a sampling schedule is the fifth um, thing to do, so you need to decide when you're going to do it and where. And then finally, design the data collection form. And here's a little example of a data collection form. You can see it's shown across the top line. It's a list of all the different tasks for this specific process. And um, so all the different occurrences are noted. And then from that, you can calculate the total observations and then the percentage of productivity versus non-productivity. Now we're just going to quickly go over how to calculate a simple work sampling. And this is a very simple calculation, but as we've talked about, it's important to um, have a contrast to a time study. And we'll see just how much easier this is. So basically, all you have to do is count the observations um, that the worker or group of workers is working versus the time they were idle. So for instance, if they were working for 36 observations and they were idle for four observations, and there's a total, obviously, of 40, then you can easily calculate the percentage of each time. So the percentage of idle time, which is 4 divided by the total observations times 100, so they were idle 10% of the time and working 90% 90 90 of the time. And then you can uh, easily base this on the eight-hour work days. Sorry, there's 480 minutes in a day, and you can easily calculate that they were idle for 48 minutes and working for 432 minutes. So a few tips when performing a work sampling. First is you need to locate yourself at the same place each time so you can have more accurate results. And then you need to limit your time at the site to actual time that's going to be needed for the observation. Um, so then you're not staying longer than needed and gaining more information than is going to be useful for the uh, sampling study. Then you want to try and record the minimum amount of data also, you want to verify any discrepancies in the data. You can go to the supervisor, whoever's in charge of the process. And then finally, you want to make note on the forms, um, make notes on the form after the operator can no longer see you to make sure you don't forget anything you saw or miss any big observations. So we're going to end with a quick example on work studying. So for example, five operators work 9,500 minutes over a course of four days. So work sampling is done, and the results say that <clears throat> They are actively working 95% of the time that they are not on break. And so using this number, they calculate that they have a performance rating of 105%. So if 6,000 pieces were produced during this four-day period and there's a 15% allowance correction, we can go ahead and determine the standard time. So basically, you multiply the total minutes they worked, so 9,500, then multiply this by their active working time or active working percent in their performance rating, divide that by the amount of pieces, multiply that by 1 over 1 minus the allowance correction, and you determine that the standard time for this specific task was 1.86 minutes. So that's just a quick example. 
And that concludes our presentation. So here's a look at a few of the sources we used. Thank you for watching.